Welcome everyone. Good morning to our friends in the West and good afternoon to the people joining us on the East Coast of uh, the country today. I'm Saad Humbert, a group publisher at Annex Business Media who looks after both OHS Canada and Talent Canada, among other national and international media brands. We have put together an amazing panel for our discussion today, which is a very important one from both an employer and a leadership perspective. Mental health is not always an easy topic to discuss. It's an area that Talent Canada is particularly focused on. Um, our journalists cover it regularly, uh, and we launched the Psychologically Safe Workplace Awards to help employers on the journey to becoming healthier workplaces. That is a program we're very proud of, and it gives your teams valuable data about their own mental health and leaders a very powerful dashboard to guide decisions on a corporate level. So before we get into things, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, first, you, the audience, are in listen-only mode. You can submit questions to the panel at any time using the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom webinar control panel. We have set aside some time at the end of the hour to answer your questions. We've also enabled the chat function today. If you guys want to have conversations uh, during this, uh, you can do that. Uh, that's just text-based. There's no audio, um, so you won't hear yourself, but you can certainly type those, those comments into the chat function. Uh, second, this session is being recorded. Everyone who registered will receive a link via email in about 24 hours that you can watch later or share with colleagues that couldn't make it today. So the focus of our conversation uh, this morning will be ways to measure your investment and to find out how your program is working. Like all things involving people, it's part art and part science. And thankfully, we have three incredibly talent, talented panelists joining us this morning to talk it through. It's tough to imagine a better trio. Uh, you know, maybe I'm biased, but I think this is a dream panel when it comes to mental health in the workplace. So I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Bill Howitt. Uh, Bill is the founder of Howitt HR uh, and its Mental Fitness Index, also known as the MFI tool, uh, that forms the backbone of the Psych Safety Workplace Awards. Next up is Liz Horvath. Liz is the manager of workplace mental health at the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Thrilled to have you this morning, Liz. And last and certainly not least is Jennifer Elia, the Vice President of Future of Work at Excellence Canada. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So let's, uh, let's kind of start off with the big question. So, you know, companies are investing a lot in mental health and looking for evidence that that investment is working. Where do they begin? And Bill, why don't we start with you? Thanks. Thanks. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you and the panel and on this conversation. So this is a big topic. Workplace mental health organizations that are starting to move from my senses from inform evidence to evidence based. What does what's that basically mean? is that we have been talking about mental health for quite a while and lots of organizations have been putting lots of effort into, okay, what do we do? We have some challenges so we want to start to solve some challenges. We want to start to identify risk factors. We want to start to impact. So they're spending a lot of time on the plan. And then the do lots of organizations are spending time on implementing something. For me, I think where we need to start really maturing this conversation is really become more clear what plan, do, check, act means. And what I mean for if whether you're a, a fan of following the CSA standards of 1003 that worked closely with the Mental Health Commission on this or not, the underlying premise is important to me when I'm out supporting organizations is around continuous improvement. And, and what I mean by that is, if you think about what's cool about when we start getting this conversation today, is the P is really discover your risk. You'll hear words like psychosocial factors. You'll hear psychosocial hazards. You'll start talking about things that are impacting the organization. In your planning, a part of it is getting your baseline, which I'll talk more about today as well. And then the idea is, okay, I have these risks and I get my baseline, my, my planning. How am I going to close gap? ultimately, how am I going to reduce mental harm and promote mental health? And then the do is we do all these things around implementing programs and policies, but these are ultimately protective factors. And what we're trying to do is to make decisions that can influence the behaviors of the employer, the leaders, the workplace mental health facilitators, and the workers to identify what are the key performance behaviors, what has to happen, very much like OHS so that we can actually start to figure out how do we have a positive impact. And then the check, that's where my biggest concern is. And that's where I think what, what we're talking about today gives organizations the opportunity to assess and to evaluate, hey, I planned this and I wanna to get to here, but it's actually what we're doing working. 
because that's what evidence is. It's moving the conversation from guessing to actually deciding and making informed decisions. So then the C part of it, we can tweak. And I'll close on this before I hand off because I'm very, very proficient. I'm staying my three minutes, Chuck, Todd, is, is that this is, a, this is a journey. There are no quick fixes. And plan, do, check, act. This is for a long haul. And we'll discuss today how these, the ideas of these awards can help create some spirit to help people make that journey. Back to you. Great, thanks, Bill. And, and Jennifer, obviously, the, you know, kind of the same question to you. Um, where do you suggest companies begin? You're posing a question, Todd, that we ponder all the time in the workplace mental health space, which is how do we know that our investment's actually working, right? Um, there's a lot of competition for not just human capacity within organization, also for dollars, um, so much going on in the world. So we need to be able to show that. And the only true way to show that the program's making that difference is to start with clear and measurable objectives from the outset. So we need to make sure there's a short list of high need areas. You know, getting into that plan, do, check, act cycle that Bill's talking about from a place of what's our main problem? Is it that absence and disability is the top concern impacting the business today? Is it a matter of how to attract specialized talent in an area where maybe skilled workers are scarce? We're, we're seeing that across a number of sectors now. And in the case of absence, you know your investments are working when those trends improve over time. And when the employees report a better experience and, and better sense of support when they're experiencing a disability claim or when they're engaged in a return to work process. So there are really specific measures to put around those very tangible and I would say common objectives in 2022. Um, for talent, it's the speed of recruiting. How fast are you getting the roles filled when specialized talent and skills are needed? And then I would also add on, are there new insights from employees that can really show that the mental health or psychologically safe culture factored into their decision to join an organization? So very different ways of coming at your plan, do, check, act cycle based on that short list of high priority items that you, you want to address. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And Liz, I'm gonna pose the same question to you, curious to get your thoughts over there at the Mental Health Commission uh, in terms of, of where, where does this journey begin? Absolutely, and thank you, Todd. And, and I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Bill and Jennifer have said. You know, we know that organizations do need to go through that plan, do, track, act cycle, because when you're putting psychological health and safety in place within an organization, often there's a culture change, there's a culture shift that has to happen. And in order for you to know that you're putting your time and effort and money in the right place to make those improvements and to see that return on investment, you need to understand what's going on at the baseline. That planning aspect is so critically important. You know, so there's two aspects to that, understanding your organizational measures and understanding what employees are saying or not saying about your organization. So the things that, have our, that uh, Bill and Jennifer have talked about, claims, turnover, conflict in the workplace is another thing to be looking at because it, it, there's a lot of time and effort that gets eaten up with conflict, absenteeism, customer service, health and safety. All of these are quantitative, quantitative data that you would want to look at at a baseline, but also understand the stories, understand what's going on behind the numbers. How are, what are people saying or not saying? Are they doing well or are they burning out? Are they comfortable speaking up or do they shut down? Would they be comfortable in recommending an, your organization as a great place to work for close friends or family? Or would they say, no, this, you wouldn't wanna work here. This is really important too in the aspect of diversity, equity and inclusion, which we know affects 
uh, the mental health of workers. So really looking at, at a, a, a very holistic view of your numbers. And like Jennifer said, understanding what are our key issues that we should be dealing with first. And, and as Bill said, having that plan to go forward to address those things through the plan do check out cycle. Okay, thanks, Lizette. You make a great point there in terms of just how many things, you know, mental health touches. It's it's not a silo, right? It impacts so many parts of the organization, so many things like recruitment and retention and, and your reputation and all that. So that that's fantastic. So, you know, when we put this panel together, that like all three of you represent organizations that have, you know, really powerful tools to actually assess programs. Um, so I would love to spend a few minutes just talking about those, those tools essentially that you have. So Jennifer, why don't we start with you at Excellence Canada in terms of, of what you guys have that can kind of measure this? Sure, thanks, Todd. And, and before I get us rolling on, on this topic, I and this is part of what I wanna make sure our, our audience takes away is what's really cool in Canada is we're, we have a lot of leadership globally in our approach to mental health at work. So um, kudos to Talent Canada bringing different organizations together to take accountability to help employers to identify options for themselves, know where to start. So I know we'll we'll talk about that more as we go on, but from an Excellence Canada perspective, um, I can make it a little more tangible by saying that when an organization invests in a mental health work journey with Excellence Canada, they're on a supported path to achieving progressive levels of excellence under the Canada Awards for Excellence umbrella. We just this month launched a new version of our mental health at work framework. This is a framework that's been in place for around 10 years. And the new revision goes deeper on elements of the moment um, around the future of work, elements around leadership and different types of leadership skills and, and qualities that are needed to lead well in the future of work, as well as equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the framework, it delivers um, a, a guideline really against four drivers. And those drivers are leadership, people and culture, planning and the implementation aspect, and then evaluation. The model is meant to be flexible. It's so that uh, employers can jump in at the scope and level that is best suited and, and even the pace that is best suited for what their organization is, is facing with regards to their mental health at work journey. And then we support them along the way. So a key part of the model too is, and because it is a progressive model is, is celebrating those key milestones at every step, looking for moments of um, coming together and saying here, we've had some wins and that only energizes and fuels the momentum on the mental health strategy over time. Because as Bill said, it's not a, a short-term thing. This is cultural. This is a years long journey. And then what we see, you know, what's really interesting is that over the past 10 years um, that Excellence Canada has been building this approach, we've been able to incorporate global best practices that come from the organizations we work with, both in public sector and private sector. Um, different sizes as well. And many of Canada's leaders in workplace mental health have walked on this journey and they continue to draw upon the Excellence Canada model to address current pressures and the trends of the day. So we'll leave it at that and, uh, and turn it over, I think, to Bill. Actually, we'll, we'll go to Liz now. Go to Liz. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, I mean, the order doesn't really matter that much, but let, let's get Liz's uh, kind of take on, on what the Mental Health Commission of Canada's program is all about. Yeah, thank you very much, Todd. Um, yeah, our program is uh, is very new, actually. So in partnership with AuditSoft, um, we are developing and piloting a new program to help organizations to conduct internal audits of their psychological health and safety management system. And we're continuing to pilot this program throughout the summer of 2022 with a small number of organizations, and we expect to fully launch it in autumn. I'll tell you a little bit more about it uh, um, as we go through the day, uh, go through the webinar. 
um, but it is a, a fairly new program. Um, it's not an awards program. It is, uh, it is an internal audit program where we'll be qualifying people to actually do these audits. Very cool, thanks Liz. And Bill, why don't you talk about uh, what we've got going on with the Psychologically Safe Workplace Awards in the, in the MFI? Yeah, thanks. It's building on the concept of Plan Do Check Act, what we have done with the award and is that we have to take a journey when we're trying to impact workplace mental health. And one, one of the things we've done is we we're using a tool called the Mental Fitness Index, which is an instrument. It's an assessment tool and it's designed for workplace mental health. And it's, it's actually a, a tool that we've used in scientific studies that we, have, we published through St. Mary's University. And we've done, we've spent the last couple of years really working on validating because we wanted to get to an evidence-based tool. So if you step back and think about what, what do you really need to know in your planning? So as the Jennifer said, and, and Liz was suggesting, so up front, we need to identify what are our what are our areas? We might actually know from our historical data, from our HRS data, from our insurance data, we might know what's, what some of the outcomes are, but we may not understand what the root cause is. So for example, in workplace mental health, you'll hear the word talk around risk factors, psychosocial factors. So what the Mental Fitness Index does, it really does a few easy things for us. One, it helps us identify what are the psychosocial factors. So if we're gonna have an award, in a point in time of an organization, it would be helpful for them to understand what are the psychosocial factors, for example, isolation, work demand. If you're not familiar with ISO 45003, I would ask you to take a look at it. It does a really, really nice job of explaining psychosocial factors, in my view, from how we organize work to psychosocial. And then the outcome of it. So if let's say isolation is that's a stressor in my workplace with remote workers like the World Economic Forum that says up to 50% of workers are working remote, remotely now or experiencing some form of isolation, that's a barrier, okay? The byproduct that or psychosocial factor is hazards, is loneliness, work demand, burnout. Okay, so employers that are trying to do the type of work we're doing, reduce mental harm and promote mental health. Okay, here are factors, here are hazards, so how are we going to get at it and why, why do we care? Well, the KPIs at organizations, the key performance indicators that they're worried about is, for example, as Jen, uh, Jennifer talked about is lowering, for example, disability costs. Okay, that's a financial cost. So sick time could predict that. So we start looking at these KPIs. So what the Mental Fitness Index does in this award, organizations that participate, they get a clarity on their psychosocial factors, their psychosocial hazards, their KPIs, so their outcomes around presentism, incivility, harassment, but they also get a profile of their entire workforce in regards to from languishing to flourishing in regards to what I think the most important thing is, how are the current initiatives being received and influencing behavior? And what's the worker's experience? So if you go back to the standard, the standard says, engage the workers, engage the workers, get their point of view. So from the planning part, we get the baseline, we get our data, factors, hazards, outcomes, protective factors. And you think about the value of this as we get that point in time up front baseline, then you do your protective factors. And then if you, the next year, and they, when you renew and do it again, your second test, now you're doing your C again. So you're constantly, then you can adjust. So it's creating that cycle. So what we really want to do to kind of pass it off now is we wanted to give our organizations clarity on where they're at in a point in time in regards to how their current initiatives and insights are in facilitating psychological safe workplaces from the employee's voice. And that's really important. This comes 100% from the employee's voice unfiltered. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. And, and thanks, Liz and Jennifer, as well. It's, it's really helpful to get a rundown of those programs, um, you know, because they, they, there's a lot of things that are, are unique to each of these programs, that, and they certainly complement each other. And as an employer, looking at them, trying to kind of decide which path to go down, uh, leads me to my next question. So, you know, these are great programs, very credible organizations behind all of them. Um, so let's help our audience really understand those differences. What makes the programs unique from each other? And maybe Liz, we'll start with you on this one. Thank you, Todd. And, and you're right, these programs do uh, complement each other. Um, you know, and, and there may be different reasons that an employer may want to choose 
uh, to go down one road or another or do all of the programs. So it's not that they need to do them all ex in exclusion of each other. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, the MHCC program that we're developing, it, as I said, it's, it's not an awards program. It is an actual audit program. And it's, it's designed to examine, <clears throat> pardon me, it's designed to examine evidence of how the management system elements are integrated throughout the organization's programs that support psychological health and safety of employees. The criteria is clearly mapped to the national standard and the international standard. Um, and what it does is it provides the auditor with access to a psychological health and safety management system audit tool, which is hosted on the AuditSoft platform. So we have partnered with AuditSoft, which has um, uh, experience in developing audit software tools, uh, health and safety audit software tools to be exact. So um, this is uh, psychological health and safety content that's being put into this audit soft platform that auditors will be able to use. So no more Excel spreadsheets, no more Word documents. The tool includes all the criteria and the guidance. It allows for the auditor to record their findings, their scoring, their, and identify their key strengths and opportunities within each of those areas and they can put their recommendations right into the tool. They can upload documents into the tool for reference and create a professional report and customizational action plan right directly from the tool with the click of a button. Um, the program will also include training and qualification for people to become auditors. So MHCC, you know, we have a small workplace mental health program. Uh, our team is very small. We can't do it all, of course. So what we're doing is trying to create this program to qualify auditors to, be, to do these audits within their own organizations as internal audits, um, or to qualify consultants who want to add this service as, as a service to their repertoire of services. So these people would uh, be uh, trained and licensed to use the, the tool. They would get technical support from AuditSoft. They get quality and oversight support from MHCC's workplace mental health team. And they would also have an opportunity to also have recognition through the awards programs because this will help to streamline and be able to, uh, to support those awards programs. Um, if they go through the awards programs and then they decide to do an audit, that's fine too, either way. Um, but, uh, but this, as I said, is a new program. We're in the process of piloting it right now. Okay, thank you, Liz. And, and Bill, um, you know, with the, the Psych Safety Award program, what's unique about that compared to the others? Um, I think where I'd like to do my kick off this exactly where Liz is when I'm listening to us. I think it's important to understand the reason we're all here because this could be very inclusive. So if you think about I'm making my journey and I want to I want to commit to a plan do check act. I really, really deeply care. This is just not about a check the box. Like look all three of us talk, we're not about check the box. We're actually about helping organizations help workers, leaders to create the habits and the behaviors like occupational health and safety to reduce mental harms, promote mental health. So if you think about that, early in the journey in the plan and do, it's very potential that someone would go to the uh, Mental Health Commission, get trained, for example, in auditing, and have some support on how to audit all their last five years, for example, where are they right now against the standard? That's what they wanted to know. And then as a part of that process, the auditing and assessing are different. You see, assessing now we're getting risk factors. See how what we're doing is different than guarding minds is it's a wonderful tool, but what we're looking at is not only what the employee is perceiving and looking at a bell curve of the average. What we're looking at is not, we're also looking at how the employee is showing up and their behaviors in, re, in regards to the experience. Because the last line of defense for workers in the world of psychological health and safety is PPP, personal psychological protection, resiliency, being able to self-advocate. Yes, the employer can have a massive role in resiliency. In other words, if you have a toxic workplace, I don't care how resilient employees are, you're going to break them and create stress. But if we actually, with intention, have psychological safe leaders, that's a part of it. 
Now let's assume we use the award and the mental health and, and we, we're working on it. Part of that aspiration is that all of a sudden what's excellent Canada's doing, they're gonna help you with your process. See, we're talking about giving you data and insights and information and education of where to start, how to begin. And then Excellence Canada's award is, okay, now you've moved your journey. How did you do? And where are you going on your journey? And so it's a process. And so for me, Excellence Canada and, and, and is really, I think, super what they're doing in regards to helping them out, evaluate do I have evidence over time and distance of everything we're doing is working and help us make that to do that. Where what our role is, is we're a point in time, we're looking at behaviors and experience, a part of a plan, like a risk assessment. And then we can help in the P and we can help in the, what I would call the, you know, plan, do, check in the C. So I think that's the biggest difference as a context. These aren't meant to compete against each other. Like they all have a value, but they're all designed to help answer specific questions and provide accessibility and scale to organizations because not every organization is going to have the capacity to have a full team on board. Okay, thank you, Bill. And Jennifer, uh, let's talk about your program at Excellence Canada. Yeah, it's, it's a good segue because that capacity of not having dedicated resources within an HR function or a health and safety function Ideally, and we're seeing this more and more, those two functions within uh, a company or an organization are coming together. But even then, um, it's, it's those leaders in mental health at work that actually have dedicated roles that are doing this work. So um, from that perspective, each and every one of the programs that we're talking about and the tools that we're even referencing are tools that people who within their HR community have another mandate, maybe they're even doing this off the side of their desk, can tap into expertise and, and um, reporting that can help them to get momentum when it might otherwise be hard. So um, I'll build on what Liz and Bill have said by saying, like the other programs, Excellence Canada begins with assessment and we bring a flexibility to how that assessment can be done. There's a self-assessment means where we provide a guide and a checklist and a core group within an organization can go through that together and submit that for scoring. And often what happens is that self-assessment punts the organization into our progressive awards program. And so it gives a sense of are you starting at the very beginning with the new um, newly launched framework? Our starting point is called mental health essentials. And so we may recommend based on that self-assessment that you're, you're starting with essentials and we're gonna give some recommendations about how you might um, address some low hanging fruit or some immediate concerns to be able to move forward and start to map out that longer term journey. And then the other levels are gold that's when you have programs, but maybe they're not coordinated in a strategic way and you need to set your purpose statement around mental health at work, um, get the structure and the governance in place, all of those really important aspects. And then, as Bill said, it's about showing sustainable results over time. So then as people or organizations progress through the Excellence Canada model, those sustained results or when you're inching to the platinum level, and then ultimately the order of excellence. Um, and many of Canadian um, companies and public sector organizations that the audience would recognize are at that order level because they've been on this journey for a long time, doing a few of those actually this year. Um, so I just wanna go back to my comment before the awards part of it is about celebrating those milestones along the way and continuing to support your initial business case for why you're embedding this as not just an initiative per se, but rather a transformative element of your organizational culture that's going to insulate you against all the pressures of the world environment right now. Um, when we see organizations come to Excellence Canada, 
it is often that they're they don't know where to start. They usually already have a strong commitment at the senior executive level. And that's not where we're focused. We're actually, okay, you've got the commitment and there's really not that sense of um, supported confidence of how to move forward. And so that's where we come in with our proven framework built over 10 years. Right, thanks, Jennifer. I think you know we, we've got a pretty good understanding now of the the basics of the programs in this short period of time. That as much as we can, anyway. Um, so I, I think the, kind of the next thing that we want to talk about is um, you know the benefits of of going down this road and, and participating in these programs. Um, we know that they can be a lot of work. Um, so why should organizations go down this road? And what are the benefits to you know achieving these types of awards or, or or participating in this process? And you know, Bill, I think we'll start this one with you. Thanks. Um, I like what we're saying is that this is not just about doing an award, though the awards are purposeful. I, I, to me, I, I continue to say is that we're doing, spending a lot of money in leadership development. We're spending a lot of money with good intentions and on support programs. I'm not sure we're spending enough on prevention, getting upstream, or actually even understanding that what is workplace mental health? Well, it's actually the percent of the time my workforce is in pleasant emotions versus unpleasant. Okay, so every interaction, whether it's reward programs, whether it's how we pay, how we organize our work, it's not workplace mental health is just not something done off the side of the desk. It's every experience the employee has, every interaction the employee has. Mental health is no longer a nice to have. We kind of, you know, we used to think many of us that, you know, we'll do EFAP, we'll train a few managers, we'll create a policy, check the box, and we'll say, yes, we've done it. That we're realizing right now, when you start thinking before the pandemic, the World Economic Forum predicted that depression will be the leading cause of premature death on the planet by 2030. We've added actually speeded this up. The World Health Economic, World Health just did a report recently that depression, anxiety up, suicides up. Organizations are starting to see historical trends in uh, mental health claims and STD, LT, and et cetera. This is not gonna go away. Workplace mental health now, the silver lining perhaps of the pandemic is starting to realize human beings are fallible. And it's time that organizations realize this, this is a part like running, if you run, uh, put electricity in a photocopy or you gotta pay to, so what's the, how, what's the currency to help a workforce come to work because they want to versus they have to, it's gonna be feeling a sense of belonging, value and purpose. And so what can happen in all of this is, is that we now have an opportunity for the value of this is that competitively employers now will need to, in my opinion, be able to demonstrate to their workforce as they have courage to have these conversations and the award that we're doing and the other things that are happening is employers are saying, we want independent, we want to get our employees voice involved. We want to actually know how is what we're doing really, really working. Because psychological safe cultures are becoming a major recruiting attraction tool and a productivity and a prevention. Also, you can start to see how boards across the country and around the world are starting to move to ESGs. And that whole idea around environment, social, and governance, a socialist of workplace mental health, our award provides data that can be used in ESG scorecards. It can be actually starting to show boards and senior leaders as what are we doing to create the behaviors, to support the behaviors, to create workplace mental health. Because I don't think if you want a sustainable workforce for the future, that this is going to be an option anymore. I think we need to become more strategic and move this from the side of the desk to this is core business like OHS. It's something you do every day, not one day a year. We do it every day with intention and purpose because we have the ability, if we do this right, to protect human beings and to increase folks experience so they can go home and support their families and communities. So this has, employers have a role in also impacting communities health as well as I think. Off to you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, Jennifer, what, what do you see as the benefits to, to going down this road? Yeah, I, I want to expand on what Bill's saying. Um, Bill and Liz and I, and Todd, you and your team as well, we've been involved in workplace mental health for many years. And 
passionate about moving forward with with some kind of momentum. So I, I just want to acknowledge for our audience that we are in this sweet spot that started with the pandemic where all of a sudden for us as practitioners, what was often a like a push, right? We're pushing executives to let us in and, and talk about the importance of this, to um, get collaborators into the rooms where they could be engaged with maybe training programs and, and things like that. Now we're it's a pull and we're, we're ready for it. And I think that's part of what's the underlying theme of this conversation today is um, there's there are so many options as to where to start. So um, as far as the benefits of um, engaging in this type of journey, I want to kind of distill it to something I see among HR colleagues um, across sectors, which is they're telling us we have a lot of programs. We're doing this, we're doing that, but we still have problems with the current social and economic pressures, and those problems are growing by the day. So there, there's no lack of, in many organizations, there's not a lack of programs, tools, and initiatives for employees. Utilization in those programs, right from the benefits plan, let's say psychology benefits, all the way through to EAP and training, is a whole other story. And so with the Excellence Canada approach, what we do is we become a member of the team, essentially, for a period of time, and work with the organization to use the framework to really understand here are your programs. We, we map them to um, a clear and well-communicated strategy and a plan so that leaders and employees can see, hey, look at what we have and then begin to see progress on those gap areas of which utilization and participation is a big one. So with that approach, we can build an internal confidence and the capabilities within the organization so that good psychological health and safety practices are embedded in the culture. And then the methodology also provides an opportunity. So if we're taking an organization through a Canada Awards for Excellence verification, for example, that process includes gathering insights directly from employees through live focus groups. And when Liz was talking about understanding the stories, this is where the stories bubble up. It's actually our secret sauce of the Excellence Canada approach. So as those focus groups um, are unfolding and you're getting those insights, it's also an opportunity to engage, to build buy-in for the work that the employer is doing and the two-way flow of accountability for workplace mental health that we wanna promote. It builds excitement and momentum on the entire journey uh, while allowing for the employee voices to be heard and those common themes that emerge to feed into the recommendations and future plans. Thank you, Jennifer. And Liz, uh, obviously the same question to you in terms of the benefits um, that, these, that this program has. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Todd. And you know, these programs, they all have wonderful benefits. And I think one of the, you know, one of the things for the MHCC audit program is that it's, it's really looking at the operations aspect of things. It's really getting down to, you know, how is, how is the management system built in with what you're doing with respect to OHS, with diversity, equity, inclusion, with your benefits programs, with your investigations, with your uh, emergency preparedness and response. So it's really getting down to that understanding. And you know, with 25 years in occupational health and safety, we know that auditing is, is uh, sometimes overwhelming, but we're trying to help organizations not to be overwhelmed by doing that. Very often you need to have, as Bill and Jennifer have both said, you need to have those baseline measurements to be able to figure out where you're going forward with. And that's, and, and you know, celebrate what you already have in place. It's a matter of identifying those key strengths and knowing how, what do we need to do? What's working for those? Very often an organization will, will have, as Jennifer said, various programs in place, but they may not know 
all of the programs that they have in place and what's working within one part of the organization and what's not working within another part of the organization or why it's not working or, or maybe they don't have it documented. So there isn't that consistency going forward. So that's, that's one of the things that the audit program does is help to show what do we have in place operationally that we need to make sure is going to carry us forward into the future. And in doing that, it gives comprehensive insight into a baseline to make those well-informed decisions um, from a strategic level and being able to, uh, uh, to map it to the national and international standards. And um, <clears throat> pardon me. And uh, so that's, that's uh, one of the main things. I'm sorry, my cold is, uh, is getting to me here. But um, the other thing that I wanted to mention too is that as, they, as an, uh, an organization would go through this, I mean, Jennifer and I have been working together for a while now, Excellence Canada and MHCC, looking to see you know, how can we uh, recognize an employer who's going through the audit program through the MHCC uh, awards process. And, um, and, and we've been looking at how to, you know, if an organization could ha go through a streamlined process through Excellence Canada's award process if they've gone through the MHCC process. So that's one of the things, one of the benefits of our organizations working together in this partnership. And um, yeah, so, I mean, the biggest benefit I think for organizations is that they're showing commitment demonstrated commitment to their workers that they care about their psychological health and safety. Um, but they're also showing that demonstrated commitment to other stakeholders too, whether it's investors, whether it's the public, whether it's their customers. The, you know, most organizations get into doing uh, psychological health and safety because they know that it's the right thing to do. They're not doing it um, because of getting an award an award is a wonderful way to demonstrate and publicly show that, hey, we're there. Um, so working together, we're so happy to be working together with uh, Excellence Canada and, and of course working together with, uh, uh, with Bill and, and Talent Canada and, and helping to promote these programs. So very happy to be doing that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Liz. And before we get to the next question, we just uh, on the Q and A, somebody was asking if we could share links to all of the uh, all of these different programs. We will for sure be doing that on Talent Canada's website. But maybe Bill, Liz, and Jennifer, as we're going through this last round, if you haven't already done so, you could post a link in the chat, um, you know, directly to the programs that we're talking about, uh, if possible. But but for sure, look look to uh, you know if you go to talentcanada.ca uh, after this, you will 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 have links up to all of the different programs and the information there. So. Uh, moving on to our next question, um, and this is kind of our last question before we get into the audience ones. Um, you know, obviously we've had a really interesting discussion. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So, you know, I'm kind of looking at, at each of you to say, if, if you had to pick one thing for the audience to take away from our conversation today, what would that be? And Jennifer, let's start with you. Thanks, Todd. Uh, I'm going to keep it really short and sweet because I'm eager to hear from the audience. If I can put one... Um, one thought for it, it's no, you don't have to do this alone. I hope you hear that there are really well thought out evidence based programs and resources for you to draw from. So learn about the options and take that first step forward. Great. Thanks, Bill. What's your what's the one takeaway you hope people get today? Yeah, I'm going to build on the pithy so we can get to the questions like for me. Plan, do, check, act. I, as, I'm, uh, as an applied practitioner, as well as a scientist, I'm gonna share with you a recent study that I just led with the Canadian standards. I, I'm fairly involved with them. And one of the things I'm fascinated with is the commitment of our country of starting to advance workplace mental health. But our last study provided some nice evidence during the pandemic response is that many organizations in trying to respond to the psychosocial factors are spending a lot of time in the plan and the do. My, my hope is we can start to get really more focus on the C. I feel these types of awards, focuses, assessments, tools can help us both in the plan and the C. So my big coaching is 
take a look at the research we just sent. That's why we're everything we do is evidence based. We just don't make stuff up. We spend a lot of time thinking and doing science behind this stuff to help organizations get results requires getting the right data, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Great, thank you, Bill. And Liz, your takeaway? Yeah, it's it's very much along those lines as well. You know, my dad always taught me um, what gets measured gets done. Um, but more importantly, he said, measure twice, cut once. You need to understand what your needs are from the beginning so that you don't waste time, materials, money, energy, uh, doing the wrong thing or putting energy in a place where it would be better served in another area. So doing that up front, measure twice, cut once, make sure you know what, what you need to do going forward. Great, thanks Liz, that, that is great advice for sure. It applies in so many things. So let, let's get to some of the audience questions now. If you have not entered your question, you can do so now using the Q&A tab. I'm also gonna scroll through the chat as well. I, I know that uh, Liz, Jennifer and Bill, you've been busy on the chat throughout today's conversation answering some questions, but we might uh, post some of them kind of out loud. But so the, the first question I have here um, is around just, someone's asking about the cost. What's the, what's the typical cost to participate um, and, and go through this, this process? Um, so I don't know, Bill, since you're unmuted, I'll start with you. Yeah, so ours is done by group size. So our the, the award, what I really want to make sure people realize it is that when the folks do the MFI, every employee gets a report in real time to provide some coaching. So what we've done is for organizations that are under 200 lives, it's around $499. That qualifies them for the award, qualifies them for the dinner, qualifies them for getting a uh, report, their own personalized report, a scorecard, 10, 10 uh, page report, plus every employee will get their own, plus they'll get a benchmark report, plus they'll get access to all our articles and journals we're doing on workplace mental health. We're really trying to drive a tr tremendous amount of value so we can make it accessible for small businesses. If you're under 500 lives, for example, it moves up just incrementally a couple hundred dollars to like six or seven hundred dollars. And the largest organization, the maximum anyone will pay for our award is 990 bucks or something like that. And, and the reason we're doing it is we really want to make sure that organizations are spending their dollars and their energy on behavioral change so that they can get some data. They can get some ideas, get some insights, and start focusing on that. Because we need, we know as a small business, the one thing I think is important: the vast majority of employers in our country that are driving our economy are under 500 lives. And when you're an employer like me with 20 workers, you know we don't usually have full HR departments, but we are still accountable under occupational health and safety for all the respect for workplace all the human rights, all the different challenges that we have. So we're trying to help organizations make workplace health accessible by creating really, really high value pricing and experiences, exposure to the high qualified folks like on this talk today. Great, thanks, Bill. And Liz and Jennifer, did you want to walk through a little bit around the pricing structure or the costs? Yeah, I, I sure I can go, Todd. Um, as I was alluding to throughout, the model is flexible with varying levels of support from an Excellence Canada coach on the journey. So um, the lowest end with our mental health essential self-assessment that can be done for just, I think, $200. Um, just gonna give you a bit of feedback on where you're at and then supported coached models of excellence to help people slot into an excellence journey builds from there. Um, so what we try to do is we understand the needs of the organization before coming forth with a quote and we help with the business case to achieve um, the funding. So in a fully supported um, Canada excellence journey, um, what we actually will do is we'll work with you to sort of say, where are you starting? How much are you doing this year? And we try to bring in extra capacity to your HR team to be able to establish that strong foundation. And then eventually you need Excellence Canada less and less. That's the whole objective. Thanks, Jennifer. 
Yes, and, and for the uh, MHCC program, because we're still in pilot mode, uh, the costs are still being worked out to make sure that uh, that the price points are exactly uh, what is going to be needed. But I can give you some uh, some over some high level information. You know, the the the, the, the cost of actually going through an audit, if we're doing the audit, is dependent on the size of the organization. Uh, so again, a quote would be uh, required. Um, the auditor qualification program, we're looking at about $3,000 to qualify the auditor, and that would include the, um, uh, the training, all of the training. Uh, there would be an annual maintenance fee, and then the license for access to the audit tool for each audit would be about $300 for an organization. So even small organizations, if they go through a qualification program, can do these internal audits, uh, small or medium size at uh, at a minimal fee, larger organizations, they might want to utilize a, a team. Um, so uh, there can be varying costs there, but we're still working all of that out. All right, thanks, Liz. Uh, next question here. Uh, any tips on breaking through the bravado in industries such as mining or construction while establishing a program and attempting to get buy-in? So I don't know who wants to tackle that one. Yeah, we've had some success with mines and we do a lot of work with manufacturing all across North America today. And the, what I have found is a couple of things. We, we, it's important for the success we've had is I work closely, the success I had is being able to work directly with closely with the senior leadership and the CEO and being able to make it simple and relatable to them, for example, you know, retaining manufacturer workers or in construction or where folks are going can be a challenge. So that we start with, okay, what, what percent of workers are coming because they want to versus they have to for a paycheck. And we started very basic. So what are the things we're doing that we need to do from a compliance perspective, but what are we doing to create the culture that tracks and can actually remove it? And the big one we're finding is creating learning, allowing people to realize that the making mistakes removing some of the hierarchy, uh, creating the ability where people can start to talk. So it's starting with small strategies of around getting micro skills and behaviors very specifically that they don't need massive programs. That's what we've learned. We have very small behavioral based programs that we can actually start practicing right around. We call it key performance behaviors. What are the things that leaders can do to charge or drain? What about meetings, charge and drain? So we found starting really small versus trying to create a great big massive strategy. And the reason I say start small is let's learn how to actually implement new behaviors and learn where the resistance is. And if there's unions involved, get those key stakeholders involved and start slow and learn how to gain trust and start conversations around removing stigma. Interestingly, we just, uh, there's a study that I do some work real quick with uh, um, that's coming out in stigma levels, you know, highest stigma level in Canada and police. Believe it or not, construction, uh, we're found, uh, um, uh, we don't know quite why, but it's fell fairly low on stigma levels compared to other sectors and industry. So we've, we're starting to try, to try to figure out if that's a part of a transient or if there's changes that are happening. But I do think it starts with conversations and going slow. And try not to do the programming in a room, boardroom, making PowerPoints. Get out and engage the workers, and talk to them about their experience and what are some things that can that can impact a psychological safe workplace. Mm. Can I um, jump in on that? Because what Bill's saying is so true, um, especially on the trust factor. So when it comes to sectors where maybe there's work to do on creating psychological health and, and true safety. Where I've encouraged employers to start is show the way, show how. And that has to come from leaders that are able to be vulnerable about their own experiences. So even if they're not struggling with mental illness, we all have days when our mental well being is not optimal, especially during the last few years. Um, so showing the way, um, so adding on to what Bill said about keeping it simple, but also that safety to share. And when, when there's not a leader, I struggled with this in different sectors over the last 10 years, when there's not a leader who's ready to be that vulnerable, 
um, maybe even authentic leader that's going to show the way. That's when you bring in people, guests who are out there and bring them in to have a chat, show the way, show the way, show how these conversations are done. You get incredible feedback from the employee audience. And eventually you'll build that safety from within the organization where people are comfortable sharing. Um, so I think that's, that's a huge part of breaking down that bravado and beyond um, say construction or manufacturing, that same phenomenon exists in things like law firms, in finance, where you know everyone's hard driving towards billable hours and it's not okay to say I'm not okay. So it is up to us to change that. And it's bringing in that kind of um, vulnerability at the top and making it very, very visible. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, next question we've got from, from the group, it's kind of a long one. I'll, I'll try to boil it down as much as I can, but essentially what they're saying, their, their leadership team is nervous about starting this program um, because if, once they open that door, um, they feel like there's gonna be expectation or responsibility to kind of walk through it and make sure they actually do something to solve it, uh, which they're afraid could be expensive or maybe set some expectations among the team. Uh, among the team. So what advice do you have on that front? Maybe Liz, if you don't mind, we'll start with you on that one. Yeah, thank you. And, and that is something that, you know, we've dealt with this for decades, really. Um, well before the national standard was developed, you know, psychological health and safety in the workplace has always been there. So, you know, the question that I've always put to leaders is, what's the cost if you don't do it? What, are, what is happening in your organization? You know, I've worked in, in uh, manufacturing and um, construction and, and different organizations where having those conversations with leadership and trying to say to them, okay, like if you're looking at things, for example, from a due diligence point of view, there are, you know, there's legal requirements that you have to follow. But from an ethical point of view, in protecting your employees, in providing safe spaces for them to be able to come and talk, to be able to work in a way where they're able to focus, where they're able to work without distraction, where they're able to bring their best selves to work and put, uh, you know, enjoy being at work and, and, and have productivity and have energy left at the end of the day when they go home to have a quality life with the people that they love. This is what it's all about. So if we're if we're afraid that it's gonna to cost too much, it really doesn't. I mean, there are, yes, there's gonna be some investment there, um, but it is way more costly not to do these things. The cost of accidents, the cost of disability, we know that mental health is, is the primary cause of disability in Canada and, and in many countries around the world. So it's just too costly not to. Yeah. I, I agree. I'll jump in real quick. Globally, Gallup poll just released a statistic that I think that because I'm a data person, that 70% of the workforce globally is disengaged. 70% of the workforce right now is their biggest driver of positivity and drain is the leader. 50% of the entire workforce has quit their job once because of the direct leader. The cost of poor leadership globally is and disengagement is a big part of it. So driving disengagement, poor leadership is $8.1 trillion in lost productivity. Canada's GDP is $1.6 trillion. So to kind of think this is a macdemonia thing, as we start to get better at getting data and making the business case the cost of doing nothing, the United States recently just published, think about, wrap your head around this, 10% of the total healthcare cost of employers right now is due to poor leadership. So I spent 12 years working on Wall Street. And I can tell you the difference between Canada and the United States is down there, we paid for everything. It's all healthcare. So the conversation behavioral health, which we call it in the United States versus mental health is growing rapidly. And the reason being, it's very simple. 35 year old, the drops from LTD to a permanent disability. And real quick, I just wanna make sure we all know the stats. If you look at WCB or you look at LTD, but 80% will unload and offload, you know, a lot of it. Now that 20% that stays there, WCB or LCD, is about 30% of that will go on. So statistically, the cost of this 
to employers is like the actuaries tables around mental health, their heads are starting to explode. It's because we never really factored that in the design up front. And we're now going to start to see great focus put on prevention and driving the cost down because employers, the cost of this is becoming prohibitive for a lot of employers. Great, thanks, Phil. And uh, Jennifer, we're pretty much out of time, but anything you want to add to that uh, commentary? I think my colleagues have said it well, Todd. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So we are out of time. So Bill, Liz, and Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Uh, as always, I always learn a lot when I, when I chat with you guys, and, and today was no exception. So uh, real quick, for more information about the Psychologically Safe Workplace Awards that uh, are put on by Talent Canada and OHS Canada, I encourage you to watch a two-minute explainer video. You can find that on psychologicallysafeworkplace.com. Uh, I'd also encourage you to save the date for September the 15th, if you can. That's when we are gathering live in person for a conference and gala dinner celebration for the Psych Safety Awards at the Global Mail Centre in Toronto. So we hope to see you there. On behalf of Talent Canada and OHS Canada and our friends Bill, Liz and Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and as always, have a safe rest of the day. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Bye. Bye. Bye.